on behalf of the Child Development Institute of Sarah Lawrence College. And thank you for joining us this afternoon, taking a few moments or an afternoon out of your summer. Um, thank you for joining us for the 2017 Thomas H. Wright Annual Lecture. Since 1995, this annual event has been held to honor Thomas Wright's dedication to Sarah Lawrence College and his long service to the College's Board of Trustees. This generous endowment was made possible by the Leon Wellenstein Foundation. This past November, CDI hosted a symposium, The Good Childhood in a World of Change, a Nordic American Dialogue on Best Educational Practices. Little did we know when planning this event just how much our world was about to change. Held just a week after the election, there was a hunger in the room for answers, for hope, for a direction. Denisha Jones was an invited speaker, and it was her voice during the two conference days that kept rising above, that kept reminding us to push back, to push forward, to advocate. It was that voice that intrigued and inspired us, and we began our quest to invite her to be the speaker today. In a recent talk at the Network for Public Educators um, annual conference, Dr. Jones laid out a strategy for change. She asked, how can we put education reform into the hands of children and parents? It's simple, she said. We must become advocates, defenders, and organizers of play. However, if we're to stay one step ahead of the corporate reformers, we must play their game and create new, bu new buzzwords that capture the attention and mask the reality. We must change the narrative. Dr. Jones' work is doing just that. Denisha Jones, PhD, is an assistant professor the College of Arts and Sciences at Trinity Washington University in Washington, D.C. She received her Ph.D. from Indiana University and as a former early childhood teacher and preschool director has spent her career as an advocate for teachers and has been active in keeping corporations out of public education. She is a founding board member for the Badass Teachers Association. She is a board member of the United Opt Out National and is a member of the advisory board of Defending the Early Years. Her research includes Interests include confronting and countering the deprofessionalization of teaching, improving assessment and evaluation of early childhood teachers, culture of relevant teaching, and youth civic engagement. She's the recipient of the 2015 BAMI Award for College Professor of the Year from the Academy of Education, Arts, and Sciences. She's drafted an appendix on special education litigation and has provided legal research to the schoolhouse to jailhouse team of the Advancement Project. She's currently a Juris Doctor of Canada in her spare time. <laughs> um, at the University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Janine Thomas. Thank you all so much. You really feel weird hearing all that stuff about you. <laughs> it does seem like I've created uh, an extra hour of the day, but I have not. I'm still working on that. Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for attending the Thomas Wright Lecture. Um, this serves as the keynote for the Empowering Teachers Program here at Sarah Lawrence College. And I'm really honored to be this year's invited speaker. Um, also, I'm really excited to contribute to the theme of the Empowering Teachers Program. Um, it's titled Teachers as Activists, Forming Alliances with Other Teachers, Parents, and Communities to Advocate for Children. Um, so I love that we're talking about early childhood teachers as activists and advocating and, and, and doing advocacy work. I've been an education activist since 2011. Um, before 2011, I knew something was wrong with education in public schools, but I didn't really take on the identity of an education activist until I returned to D.C. Um, and attended the first Save Our Schools rally and conference. Um, and so I, I began to forge that identity as an activist. I met a lot of what I like to call my education activist comrades. Many are here in the audience. Um, and I quickly met others. Three organizations formed shortly after our time in D.C. in 2011. The Badass Teachers Association, as you heard, United Up Down, and even defending the early years, all kind of grew out of that first event, right? People met there, went back, used the internet, started organizations. Some of them grew faster than we could have ever imagined, um, and others are still growing. And so we're all doing this work. That's really important. Today, being an activist really guides my work as a teacher educator, a researcher, and as you heard, yes, a future lawyer. <laughs> as I prepare young women um, at Trinity Washington University to become early childhood and elementary education teachers, I bring my activism in the classroom in hopes that they are inspired to see themselves as more than just a teacher. Um, and it's not just that it's um, a 
teaching in the female profession there into women's college. So I'm only really dealing with undergraduate women. Um, so, you know, there's nothing wrong with just being a teacher, right? It used to be that's all we wanted to do. I was 12 years old, and my sister will tell you I wanted to be a teacher. I knew that. I used to make her suffer through um, summers of me teaching them. I was the oldest of the three, and my mom let me turn it over to me, and I was running school every day in the summer and wanted to be a teacher, and they had to suffer through that. Um, but I've learned that today, um, being a teacher is not enough. Right? Part of it is I look into my students' eyes, I want them to do more than just survive. Getting up every day and just trying to survive is not a way to live, it's not a way to be. Um, if young people are going to survive and flourish and grow as educators, they must see themselves as advocates and activists. Right? But what exactly is an activist and how does that differ from being an advocate? Or is there a difference? Um, and more importantly, do you identify as an activist and advocate of both? So to make this a little interactive, you're gonna need your phone. Um, I don't know the service, if it goes out, you can connect to the Wi-Fi here, if the Sarah Lawrence College Wi-Fi is it's good, um, to, to complete the poll on the next slide, right? So how many of you guys are familiar with poll everywhere, if you've used it before? So it's pretty straightforward. If you're on a tablet, you can go to the polleasy.com slash Denisha Jones 521. If you're on your phone, you wanna text the number 37607, that's the number you're texting. And then first you text Denisha Jones 521. And you'll get a reply message saying you're part of the poll. And then you'll be able to answer the question and your answer will pop up on the screen so we can see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to do this in my classes and be a little bit more interactive with my students um, so that they're not so bored all the time. Um, so the first question is what is an activist, right? So you can type a few words, a word, what, how would you define an activist? What, if someone asked you, what does an activist look like? Um, how would you define that? And I think, I think it's capped at 40 responses, so <laughs> if you get more than 40, you'll probably stop because I'm not paying for the... I'm sorry? Yeah, so the number you're texting to is 37607. And then you text Denisha Jones 521. And then you'll get a message saying you've been entered to the poll. And then you can text your response right after that. And it should pop up on the screen. Who works to change what is wrong? Yes. Being engaged in what matters, definitely. This is the fight for our lives, and it's really important. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll do another minute here, and then we'll go to a couple more. Planners who teach us follow your believer, someone who doesn't accept the status quo. Absolutely. So now I want you to think about advocate for the next one. Keep 
keep your eyes open. And I maybe you don't see a difference, and maybe you do, so I was just kind of getting a sense of what you guys think. Um, fight for those who have clarity of voices, absolutely. Use the social media. There's a lot of questions on whether social media activism is working. Well, if you ask a group of 50,000 badass teachers, we'll tell you it works really good. <laughs> <laughs> Moral voice, be badass, absolutely. People wonder if that's a good way to be, and we've learned it's the best way to be. <laughs> A person who campaigns to bring about political or social change. Great. I don't know if I tapped out. I don't know if it's a tummy. Let's go ahead to the next one. You're going to keep texting to the same number. Um, stand up for others. Great. So this one is asking, what is an advocate? So you can also, if you think of a difference, you can type those in. Same text response, and it shouldn't, um, you shouldn't have to re enter it again. It should allow you to keep texting the same number. and stands up for what they believe, a teacher can be the student's best advocate, yes. Someone with a strong voice for all children stands up for something. Give voice to those who are marginalized, which is such important work, by right? sharing your voice and your privilege with others. Someone who works on behalf of someone else's needs, or their own, right? Some of this is our needs as well, too. A person who champions those who are marginalized, right? works for what they believe in, speaks truth to power, I love it. I see some similarities here with the activism, which is great. Helping others navigate systems of power. Speak out, argue for someone who needs your voice, and our children and their families really need our voice. They won't back down, which is very true. One who speaks for those who feel powerless, help someone, child and family navigate an institutional setting. That is so important, especially for some of our immigrant families, our emerging bilingual students, being that support for them. Communicate with the higher ups, government, school board, and other authority figures. Teach the tools of change, that is powerful. Speaks up for the underdog, champion, gives a voice to those that don't have it. Someone who uses their voice for the voiceless. Great. Spread the word, yes. Keeps the fight going. One who is committed to learning how to think about a group of people and committed to speaking out with that thinking. Excellent. People who take a stand, speak up, organize others. Someone who listens to those who might be less powerful than them and providing direct action to get them what they need. So important. Someone who makes an active choice to create change in the world, takes a stand for what they think is important. These are all really, really good. So I want to thank you. Someone trying to change things. So now I want you to think about is either last year or coming up, what do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as an activist, an advocate, or both, right? Because maybe um, you prefer one or the other, or, or maybe you do see one of both. Empowers others, one who pleads the cause of another, helps people find their voice and use it. Great. One who brings awareness of issues that impact. When you fight for a cause, when others are silent. Warriors. I have a law school professor who calls his students social justice warriors. Which is important. Great. So the last one now, you're just going to text a letter. You're going to text um, A, B, or C. If you think you're an activist, an advocate, or both. And then it'll show it as a survey up on the screen so we'll get a sense of what people So it looks like uh, most people see themselves as both. There's a good amount of people who feel <coughs> more comfortable in their own advocate and some um, that are 
others who are see themselves as activists. And so I wanted to start with this because I think it's important um, to, to kind of talk about a little bit about what does it mean to be an activist and advocate and why it's important to either have one or both identities in the work we do um, as teachers. Um, I'm not, I, I struggle on whether there needs to be a distinction between the two. I think a lot of people like to hear the word advocate. You think of a person testifying and a council member or helping people sign a petition, which is great, right? And I think if you think of an activist and you think of someone at the G20 summit wearing a mask and throwing a, right? So there's a, most people don't want to seem um, like the more radical, right, type of activism. And so, um, but I think uh, what's important is to remember that um, regardless of what label you give yourself, right, we want to inspire teachers and those who work with young children and their families to be advocates or activists for their profession. Um, and because we don't want them to spend the next several years, as I mentioned early, in survival mode, right? Every day at work wondering if you need to be looking for a new job, a new profession, um, wondering why you're doing this at all, right? We don't want that kind of feeling of defeatedness and hopelessness that can take over sometimes. Um, what we need are teachers that can flourish and thrive in their profession and to be the best teacher that they can be. And engaging in advocacy and activism can serve as what I call nourishment for the soul. It can sustain you even when things look bleak and the future is really uncertain, which it is right now more than ever. And so, yeah, sorry, I should have went there already. So that was a little bit of what I said. Surviving is not the last teacher thing to flourish, and we also need um, nourishment for our soul. So I um, travel a lot, <laughs> about 10 times a year or more. I like to keep track if I'm going to do something once a month or if I take a month off. Um, <laughs> often to attend a conference, a rally, or a march. Um, I, my friends and family often ask me, why do I travel so much? And I, you know, well, one, I'm single and I don't have any children. I'm like, why should I be home? <laughs> um, and, and second, because activism feeds my soul, right? Um, democracy really nourishes my mind. And when I'm with my comrades, we are discussing, we're planning, we're even arguing, right? I'm recharging my body to continue this important work. Um, I just left an amazing gathering known as Free Minds, Free People in Baltimore, Maryland. It's an event that happens every two years, and I went in 2015 to Oakland, um, California, and I thought it was one of the best um, gathering of diverse people fighting in education, not just fighting for education, um, but it was really youth-centered, um, people of color, it was affirming for LGBT people. Um, this time we had a huge discussion on disability advocacy, which was great to see that brought in as well. Um, and I came straight here. I left there Sunday, parked my car at the train station, and came straight here. And people think that's crazy, right? Why would you do this back to back? But I knew being in that space would give me what I needed to come here and work with you guys. I'm giving the talk today, but I'm staying for the week um, to take part of the program so that I can learn and share um, with those who are going to be here as well, too. So activism is the food for the soul. If it was diet food, my doctor might leave me alone about my BMI, <laughs> but it's not diet food. <laughs> and in fact, we actually eat poorly because we're traveling and we're eating <laughs> in train stations and all that stuff. But I encourage you to embrace being an activist or an advocate as an integral part of your identity as a teacher of young people. Um, the survival of this profession depends on your ability to be more than just a teacher every day. So now I want to focus on two topics that's going to guide the remainder of my talk. Learning from failure and this idea of protecting childhood. As you heard from Lorraine's introduction, um, I was invited to speak at the American Scandinavian Foundation um, Dialogue on the Good Childhood last um, November. There I was approached by a gentleman named Helg Wasmus. Um, he wanted someone from Defending the Early Years to write an introduction to a journal article. So it was a special journal issue titled, Early Childhood Education, the Global Education Reform Movement, Maintaining a Developmentally Appropriate Focus. So I wasn't writing a research article for them, I was just writing the introduction piece. Um, and so that title of that article was, When All Else Fails, We Must Protect Childhood, which I'm using base for our talk today. Um, so what are we talking about? This global education reform movement, um, is, is part of what we're fighting against. So as I mentioned, I've been, early, I've been active in this fight um, to stop the spread of privatization of public ed and the spread of GERM, which is a, is a version of that in the United States. When we say GERM, we mean the Global Education Reform Movement. Um, however, I'm ready to declare our efforts and the efforts of those who came before me as failures, right? <laughs> 
um, which is tough. A lot of people, um, they think that's harsh. How can you say we failed? I'm doing this work. We're doing this work. How dare you call us failures? Um, but I think to, there's something to be learned from, from acknowledging that you failed, right? It's a chance to regroup and to rethink and to develop a new strategy. Um, and there's a quote from John Dewey um, that said, failure is instructive. The person who really thinks learning the, 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 sorry, the person who really thinks learns quite as much from his failures as from his successes, right? We need to take this opportunity to use failure to help us figure out how are we going to move forward in this space um, that, we are, that we find ourselves in. We know that protecting children from experiencing failure is not good for their development. Right? When faced with a challenge they cannot succeed, if they haven't experienced learning from failure, it can be damaging to their self-concept and their self-efficacy. So when used appropriately, we know failure can be a tool for learning how to get it right. Um, without failure, how do we know that we've even really succeeded? Right? We just might be thinking we have, but we don't really know until we know that we failed, and then we know um, that we got a different result. So for now, I'm declaring the work of education activists to be a failure. Um, this doesn't mean we have not won some important battles. We definitely have. I know here in New York, they've been fighting opt-out and testing, and they've been, they've been winning some battles, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but those tend to benefit one school or one community, and do not extend into the national or even sometimes the full state level. So my focus is on education nationally. And to my knowledge, our attempts to reclaim public education as a right for all children have failed. Right? We've been doing this for a long time, but it hasn't. Before um, we examine our failures more closely, I want to quickly review what I mean by these things, right? Just so we're all on the same page, germ and privatization of public education. It sounds so bad, like why would they use that as their title? Global education reform movement, germ, right? It is a germ, it's a virus, as, as Patsy <laughs> Thalberg mentioned when he talked about. So what is it? Um, as I mentioned, Patsy Thalberg, who's a Finnish uh, scholar, notes that the germ emerged, germ emerged in the 1980s and it consists of five global features. Standardization, which we see through standards, through Common Core, and other uni unified measures that kind of say all children should know this at this time, even on some certain days, right? They want to be able to go in any classroom in the state of New Jersey and know that all kids are learning the same thing, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, we also, it's a focus on the core subjects, right? That's it. We only got a couple things. Everything else is not important. Um, the search for low-risk ways to reach learning goals. I think that's so important. We're not trying to take risks. We're not trying to um, take the time it takes to get things done. Um, we want to make it quick and dirty. Use of corporate management models and test-based accountability. So um, this is, these are the five tenets of that. And although none of these elements have been adopted in Finland, uh, where Mr. Salberg does most of his research, they have invaded public education in the United States and in other countries, right? We've seen them in other places as well, too. Um, and in the U.S., we typically refer to these as privatization, right? So we talk about the movement to take education out of the public sphere and into the private sphere, right? So um, as we know, um, and this is a feature, I should start, but this is a feature of, of the aspect of neoliberalism, which is another term I just want to make sure we're all familiar with, because it drives germ in the United States. Um, and so it's the idea that it's a liberalist idea that we favor free market capital. And in a true um, free market capitalist state, there are no public schools, right? There's nothing run by, by the public, by the government. Um, public services will be turned over to the private sector. Institutions that once belonged in the public sphere, including healthcare, prisons, and even water, are being put in the hands of corporations. And we know their desire is to make a profit. And so we know that by law, they have to make a profit, right? If their board doesn't do what it takes to make a profit, then they can be ousted. Right? failing to meet that fiduciary responsibility. Um, and so that's problematic, right? We have private prisons that demand that cities guarantee a 95% occupancy where they're going to be charged a fine. You have to keep your prisons 95% full. Whether people are committing crimes or not, you're going to find a way that new things become crimes, right? Things you wouldn't have really cared about before become a crime now, worthy of a longer prison sentence because you are mandated to keep a prison 95% full. Um, so really think about what that means as we, as we think about privatization. Um, health insurance companies dictate what medicine and services people receive based on how much they can pay instead of what they really need, right? You're always marketed things that you might not really need, but it, it's what's in the best interest of the company. Um, so we know that when profit is a goal, the needs of human beings 
become discarded unless they can generate a measurable return on investment. And that's a challenge to education, which is not a business, which is not a commodity, but is a human right for all people in the world, right, to, to have this education. So we can see how these five features of germs have, that germ have really found their way into the United States education policy and reform. Um, so first, the comic, oh, we have charter school um, explosion happening. This is just DC, so it's not showing in every place. It's still, most kids attend traditional public schools, but I live in Washington, DC, and they're slowly creeping to the 40, 45% of kids in DC are going into charter schools. And we see the growth from 1996 all the way to today. Um, so that's one area, right? That's the part of the corporate management falls under that as well, too. Um, we also have um, the testing as well, too. Um, the ACA movement has been working really hard to kind of scale back on some of the testing, um, but it hasn't gone far enough, right? So these are some of the ways when I say we failed, we failed to stop these things from happening, right? Charter growth is unprecedented. Um, the, the testing movement hasn't stopped. We felt like we won a battle with the passage of ESSA because we included the right of parents to opt out. But they remain, there remains the right to demand 95% of testing of all students. So that's not really a win, right? Because we're not going to get um, the chance to opt out. And we see a change in what's happening with the testing movement. The test makers are on to us. They know we're using opt out of the strategy. And so they're like, really? OK, so we can play that game. And it's called personalized learning or compute competency-based learning. And now you don't need to opt out of the test because we're going to test your kids all day, all the time, in front of a computer screen and call it personalized learning. Try opting out of that. I mean, we are working on opting out of that. But now you're opting out of having your kids sit in front of a computer screen all day, right? You, I mean, that should be opting out alone because that's a terrible idea for most children, right? But that's where we have to shift our game as well, too. Um, the Common Core standards. We, we failed to stop the Common Core standards from being pushed down into young kids, and we know they're problematic. This is a research study from um, the study of the early years that looked out looked at bad reasons why we don't want to use the Common Core standards in math and other areas. We know um, that they're developmentally appropriate, and we hear all these reports about how um, kindergarten is new, uh, first grade is new. No, sorry. Kindergarten is in the first grade, first grade is in the second grade, so it's being pushed down, right, onto our children. This need to be college and career ready. I believe there's a standard in kindergarten where they have to write a, a paragraph, right? That's like a new thing. You have to write a paragraph. I just couldn't imagine when I taught kindergarten asking my five-year-olds to write a paragraph, like getting them to listen to my paragraph was really good, but writing a paragraph that, that doesn't seem um, really proper. But that's also one of the one of the issues. Um, other ways we fail, right? The deprofessionalization of teaching. Um, organizations that per, that take people with no experience and turn them into teachers with little training and put them in the most needed communities, right? So Teach for America, the New Teacher Project, there are other ones. They're they're gaining ground. Um, I work in teacher ed, so this is close to my heart. I. I have young girls who spend four or five years becoming a part of this profession, incurring debt, taking on student teaching for just 15 weeks of full-time work and no pay, to then compete for a job opening with someone who did none of that, but is just as qualified as they are for the same job, right? It's very, it's very upsetting um, to, to tell them this is the reality, this is the world we're in right now. You're better for going in about the right way, even though it doesn't feel that way, right? It feels like um, they should have done it, they should have done something. Um, so that's another area that I say we failed it. And then lastly, um, discipline issues despair, um, in, especially starting in preschool, right? We have um, data from the Office of Civil Rights that shows that 42% of black boys from preschool are being um, suspended from preschool in 2011, 2012. 42%. I get it. I was a preschool teacher. I was a preschool director. I know it starts when parents come to you and they're pissed at that kid and hit your kid and what are you going to do about it? And I was told over and over, when are you going to expel that kid? I said, the day I resign. I, <laughs> I can't expel him or else I fail to do my job, right? I, and we have to find out a better way to keep it going. So I know there are a lot of pressures on teachers sometimes. It's not up to the teachers. The administrators make the choice. And I didn't know when I sent two boys to the principal's office they were going to be suspended. I never sent anyone on campus. They were five. I had no idea that's what she was going to do. But that was the rule that because their pencil broke blood, they had to be suspended. Yeah. Um, so I get it. It's not, I'm not blaming teachers. I'm saying we have to think about this and what can we do in our classrooms to kind of mitigate against some of the situations we find ourselves. So this is what I mean by we failed. All of these things are happening, um, and, and they're, they're going to keep going.
going, right? Where you have a lot of But I believe there's power, as I mentioned, in accepting failure. Um, because failure can lead to success, right? They're on the same road. People think you're choosing one option, but you usually um, get to success because of the repeated failures in the work that you're doing. Um, we must acknowledge these failures so we can understand the limits of our collective efforts and decide how we can refocus our energies towards a future that will lead to more successful outcomes. People think that success is a straight path, but we know that's just not true, right? Um, all of those in the middle, those are the failures, right? <laughs> those are the failures over and over and over again to finally get to that success. I mean, it's important that we experience those so we can improve what we're doing. We see it with young children when they try and, uh, and do something and they keep failing at it and then they finally get it right. And that look of awe on their face, right? That's when they know and that's when it's going to last forever. So, you know, we're living in a time where, you know, we have a scary person in the White House and most people just see the fear of what's happening. But what I saw and what I still see is how failure drove lawyers to the airport to sit there and stay for days to help people coming in, right? That's the power of realizing we failed to stop Donald Trump, point blank. And I'm scared we're going to fail to stop him from a second term. Right? That's the fear of us every day. Um, it's another, another long conversation at the reception. But, um, but people learn from that failure, right? We took to the streets when he tried to ban uh, Muslims from entering this country immediately. We made our voices heard. We've been fighting around the clock. We've had um, know your rights training at my school where a lot of my students are DACA students and they don't know whether they should leave or um, are they going to be allowed to stay. We've been creating sanctuary city laws and strengthening those. So there's, there's something we've gotten. I mean, yes, the work is hard and the outlook is still sad, but we're, we're more energized, right? And if you think about it, when Obama was president and when he was doing some of the similar things with the deportations, we did not challenge him, right? It was harder to challenge the first black president for those of us who are Democrats and liberals than it is to now challenge Trump. And I think the same thing would have happened with Clinton, right? Because we wouldn't want to seem like we were challenging her as a female, so we would have been a little less. And now there's like, no, we are resisting this man full on. There's like, no need to hold back. So again, I'm not saying he should be elected to a second term to keep the fight going. That's not what I want at all. But I, I do want to point out that Failure leads to success in certain areas. It wakes people up and it, it gets them going and gets them moving. Um, so I think that's really important. So what do we do now? Um, a couple things that we might want to think about. Um, I mentioned this in other talks and I keep mentioning it because one of the, the tenets of the work I'm doing is we have to change the narrative. Um, the narrative around germ and the attacks on public education has to be changed, right? Attacking this accountability movement and the push for tougher standards, the way we do it is kind of proven to be a losing strategy. We insist over and over that these measures are harmful for student development and learning, but all they do is brand us as unwilling to be held accountable for ensuring that students can learn, right? So we know it's harmful, but that doesn't make way in this argument, right? It's not, it's not helping us move our case further. The more we resist test-based accountability, and inappropriate reforms, the more we are branded by the corporations and privateers as resistant to innovation. And that's big with this personalized learning, because I can hear the argument now. I don't want my kid sitting in front of a computer screen all day. Oh, you want your kid at a disadvantage in, in the technology war? So especially if you're advocating that this shouldn't be happening to black and brown children, then you're going to be advocating for the digital divide that already plagues low-income communities, right? So they're already going to have that to push back on. So that narrative is not necessarily going to work. It needs to be changed. Um, and so that's where I came up with this, this idea of protecting childhood, right? It's a new narrative as well. Um, so what does this mean, a focus on protecting childhood? Um, well, first, we also have to make it, I think, a nonpartisan issue. And I say learn from our elders, um, because there are Organizations, I always think of the work of the AARP, right, and how they work to do work for elders. And it's really nonpartisan, right? This is not a Democratic or Republican issue. I'm sorry, we don't have very, very friendly Democrats in office. Right? 
that really care about what's happening. I just don't know that many. When I go talk to them, they're the TFA are in their office, they're all pro charter. I'm just like, I gotta go. Like, I just, like, it's just so really few. I mean, there are a few out there, but they're few and far between. Um, so it needs to be a nonpartisan issue, right? And that's what AARP does. Elderly people need protection in their time of life, and everybody's responsible for providing that protection. Doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. Well, so do children. They need protection in their lives. Whether they're a Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter. Everyone can get behind the idea of protecting childhood. If they don't, they're going to sound like a terrible person, right? You know, we, we don't want to go back to the days, I think, of like Game of Thrones, which we're really into, right? How children are expected to like, you know, get married at 13 and take over and become you know, adults. We don't have that. We've decided that childhood is a very important time for children. And so we need to protect that because we're losing it in all of these things. We're losing the innocence of childhood, which is very problematic. And then we must communicate um, a stronger message, right? And this is where people d disagree, don't use nationalist rhetoric, don't use war metaphors. I'm beyond all that, right? As I mentioned earlier, this is the fight for our lives. So that's what the theme of the Free Mind Free People event. There are young people there who are literally fighting for their lives. The right to go to school and to not be treated as a criminal, to, to wake up every day, to make it home to their loved ones, um, that's what this is about, right? And so it's, it's important to think about the language that we're using um, and how that's important because language really matters, right? So we must emphasize why is it important to protect childhood? Um, why should others care about the state of childhood? We need to make it clear that protecting childhood is a matter of national security. This is how important this is, right? And if we're not willing to go that far to use this language, then we lose an opportunity to really drive this home, right? It may seem far-fetched to invoke such nationalist rhetoric, but the truth is the future of the United States of America depends on our ability to protect childhood. Think of all the issues we face in the world, right? We cannot produce capable leaders who can take on global problems if we allow childhood to become an experimental playground for corporations and social engineers, right? We need competent young people to solve the future. Because we're not leaving, leaving, them, leaving them the best world, right? We're leaving them a lot of challenges to solve. Global climate crisis, right? How are we going to solve this? Responding to overpopulation. I, at Free Mind Free People, there was a gentleman from Palestine talking about the water project, and he said, the World Health Organization has said in 2021, the Gaza Strip will be in, uninhabitable and there will be no water. And there's already a couple million people living on 153 square miles of land. Like how, I, I couldn't even understand that, right? There's all those people living there and it's not gonna be livable in a couple more years, right? We're gonna see this happen in our lifetime. So how do we deal with that? World hunger, right? World hunger continues to be an increasing problem in, in a lot of the rest of the world. Um, global diseases, right? These are tough issues that require competent individuals to work collectively to engender new solutions. And we have the best chance of producing citizens capable of leading the future when we protect childhood of all children, when we give them the space to play and to dream and to think and to solve problems. And that's not happening in our standardized classrooms and our love for testing, right? They're not getting those experiences that they're going to need. So we must learn from our failures um, and develop a new strategy. Um, that promotes the vision of early childhood education we seek. We have a lot to learn from our international neighbors, right? We all know filling schools are the get best. My dad posts some video to my Facebook page about filling schools. What do you think? I'm like, Dad, I've been talking about this forever. Of course, I want to go live in Finland, but it's too cold. <laughs> Um, you know, and so he's like, I, this is the work, this is what I'm doing, right? We want that kind of stuff. But Finland has never allowed germ to come to their schools because instead of the marketization, they stay focused on core commitment to ideals for their schools. And it's a fight, right? It's not easy. People want to privatize things out there, but they resist, right? They, they look at other areas to keep um, the public schools working for their children. Also, I always think of Reggio Emilia, um, the philosophy and how it was created, the history of it, right? If you remember, it was after the devastation of World War II, and it was like, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? A dictator took over our country and took us to war. How do we not let this happen again? We start with young people. Imagine that, right? Like, that's really the founding of where that came from, right? And they, it created this world-renowned 
design approach to educating young children that really posits the image of the child. They're capable, they're strong, right? We look at, it strengthens the role of teacher, the parents, and um, the environment in working with children, right? It's a model, right, that can be built on. And so again, learning from that failure. Another place that does that really well is Germany. Right? Germany has to live with the reality of the, the, the Nazis and what came out of their country. You know how they deal with that? They teach it explicitly in the curriculum to the students all the time. This will never happen again in our country because we won't allow you to forget that it happened. Right? You take those failures and you turn them into strengths. So perhaps we can learn from our failure to stop germ and develop a philosophy centered on the protection of childhood that is nonpartisan and driven by the necessity to ensure our national security. And because giving up is not a solution, and doing the same thing we've always done and expecting different results only leads to more failure. So one thing that I left out of the article um, that I feel compelled to include in this presentation is this idea that we have to protect childhood for all children, right? This is where it gets really problematic. If our work only benefits white middle class children, then we failed an even greater task, right? What is the point of doing this if that's all we're doing it for? Um, this past weekend, I once again had the same discussion um, regarding what exactly in public education are we trying to save? I think this happens a lot when we get together and say that. So what are we fighting for? What are we trying to do, right? Many say, well, we want to get back to the good old days before privatization, right? Well, those days weren't good for everybody. <laughs> so forget that, okay? Like, I was the exception. I did exceptionally well in public school. I had a great disposition for learning. My teachers loved me. But I'm not the rule. I'm not the majority. I had siblings who didn't have that same experience. We went to the same school. We came to the same house. And they hated it. And the teachers did not have a relationship with them that they had with me, right? And so it, you can't go back to that idea that it was, it was a really good time back then because it wasn't a good time for most people. Um, so as we rush to save public education, we must ask ourselves, what exactly are we saving? In reality, public education is an institution that denied people of color, black people in education, and equal education for years. And then when they were finally forced to integrate, they fired all the black teachers, right? This is some historical stuff for the teachers unions. They're forcing integration. A, a colleague I know in Georgia did some really amazing research on what happened. They convinced all of the black teachers to join the union, and then they fired them all. Um, and so they took over the schools. And the black teachers were so important, right? Because they inspired the black children to do well. You know, we, we had really strong black teachers in all black schools. They were just of poor quality. They didn't have a lot of resources, right? But the teachers were the backbone of that community, and we lost them all. And then quickly we saw black children being labeled into special education because they were being taught by teachers who did not understand them. And then, of course, we see them being suspend suspended and expelled from school. So I don't know about you, but that's not the institution I want to save. Right? Um, but there are good things from public education that I believe are worth saving, but they must be provided to all children. And we have evidence that this isn't happening, right? So earlier this month, um, the Center on Poverty and Equality, Inequality at Georgetown Law put out a report titled Girlhood Interrupted, the Erasure of Black Girls in Childhood. Has anyone seen this report? Yeah, it's out. You can find the download the PDF, you can Google Girlhood Interrupted, and it should come out. Um, it's about 24 pages. It's like a policy brief report. Um, so the study wanted to examine how adultification affects black girls in education and the juvenile system. Um, so when we think of adultification, it can come from two places. They talked about it being societal, where children are socialized and function in a more developmental stage. And that happens today in many low-resource communities, right? So think of emerging bilingual students having to translate important medical information to their parents because they're the only ones who speak English, who understand English, right? Um, or having to pay bills and having to take on these responsibilities and be the broker of these institutions. You have eight-year-olds, you know, doing this for their parents, right? That's an, an adultification. Um, but it's also how adults might stereotypically perceive children without knowing them, right? Perceive them as being older, right? Perceive them as being more mature and less worthy of nurturing and support. So the report looked at that second type of adultification. Um, and again, it examined this root of adultification of black children comes from slavery, where black children were slaves and were treated as child, child and denied a childhood, right? They weren't allowed to have that, that special period of childhood. Um, and so we know already, the research already showed that this 
um, happens to black boys when police believe them to be older um, than they are and more culpable for committing a felony compared to white boys, thus denying them the privilege of childhood innocence. This study wanted to see to what extent the same thing was happening to black girls, and the findings show that black girls are also denied this privilege of childhood innocence. Oh, sorry. So they said um, black girls seem older than white girls at the same age. They, see, they need less nurturing. Um, they need less protection. They need to be supported less. They need to be comforted less. They're more independent. Um, they know more about adult topics, and they know more about sex, right? And so they surveyed a bunch of people. They, they looked at this statistically, and these were the findings. So what does this actually mean for the black girls in our schools and our classrooms? Well, think about it. If your teacher thinks that you're more mature, older, and more experienced with adult topics, are they willing to provide you with the same type of nurturance and support that they would perceive someone who is less mature, right? You, you, you judge how you respond to children based on what you think they can handle. If you think black girls can handle the world, then you're going to be less responsive to their needs, right? And they're still just girls. Um, they discuss how these beliefs can lead to less leadership opportunities for black girls and mentors because they're perceived not to need it, right? Um, and of course it affects how we discipline them, right? There's this lot of, the, the discipline statistics are just as bad for black girls as they are for black boys. They get more harshly because they're seen as more mature and more culpable for their actions, right? So the study is really important um, to read and, and it coincides with other studies that they looked at in other areas. And we know what this looks like. The denial of childhood for black boys can result in death by police. The police who killed Tamir Rice while he played in the street believed him to be much older than a 12-year-old boy. Many people argued that Trayvon Martin was not a boy, but in reality, he was a high school student, not in school, because he was suspended. I didn't realize a lot of people didn't know that. They didn't know why he wasn't in school, and he was at a dad's house. He was out of school on suspension, right? And that's what led to him not being in school and not being home at that time. And Jordan Davis was also 17, but many people saw the picture that he's not a boy, he's an adult, right? So when we fail to protect childhood for all children, the consequences can be dire. So what can we do? I don't want to leave it all gloom and doom. I mean, it is pretty depressing, but there are things we can do. Um, I don't believe that teachers and education alone can solve the problems of poverty, racism, and oppression. Too much has been put on our shoulders. We, we can do a lot, but we can't do it all. We have to work with other institutions. Education is connected to healthcare, it's connected to housing, it's connected to water, it's connected to juvenile systems, it's connected to everything, right? Um, but as teachers, I tell my students all the time, you can't blame all the outside factors and just wash your hands and live in a world of hopelessness, right? You do have to take some responsibility for what you can do in the classroom every day. Um, and you can ensure that the children in your classroom receive the best possible care and education. Um, and that means understanding how bias might affect how we view children. That study was a study on implicit bias, um, the other one of the girls who interrupted. And this is also another study I read which I found interesting um, that looked at implicit bias. So what is an implicit bias? It's just that. It's subtle, often unconscious, uh, subconscious stereotypes that guide our expectations and interactions with people. Um, and so they're, they're just implicit, they come about. But they have real consequences for how we treat children who do not look like us. So this study examined um, some early childhood teachers. They must have been at the NACI conference, right? They got 135 early childhood teachers at a national conference, they said. Um, and they brought them in to do a couple of tasks. And they, they used a lot of deception in this one, so people were upset at the results. But first they were asked to watch a video of children playing and let them know. So they said, we want to study, um, how teachers detect challenging behaviors in the classroom. Sometimes this involves seeing behavior before it becomes problematic. So they're going to have a watch a video segment with four children playing, and they said, let us know if you see something that you think could lead to challenging behavior. Well, there was no challenging behaviors in the videos. They wanted to see when you're expecting behavior, where do you look? And the video said, four children, a black boy, black, uh, black girl, white boy, white girl. And they were just measuring the eye gates, right? How long were they looking at? And the results um, were clear, right? They found that early childhood teachers and staff tend to observe black children more closely, especially black boys, when challenging behaviors are expected, right? Um, and so that was interesting, right? That there, there wasn't anything wrong, but they kept saying, yep, that looked, that looked like he was about to do something bad, that looked like, but even not when they identified where they looked, they could track 
who they looked at through the whole 30 second video and they really kept their eyes focused on the black children and especially the black boys. Um, they did another task where they gave them a written description of vignette of a child, a preschool child, and they used a stereotypical black or stereotypical white name and asked them to rate the severity of the behaviors described. Um, and so some participants were then given additional background information about like their mother is depressed, the father um, doesn't come around a lot, all these other things that might contribute to why this child is behaving this way. Um, and so when family background information was withheld, the white teachers appeared to hold black preschoolers to a lower behavioral standard. Um, whereas the black teachers, when they knew more about the family, they, let, they held them to a higher standard, right? So there was this, um, disparity there. And then additionally, when black background information was included on black children, white teachers were more likely to believe that there was nothing that could be done to help this child. It was hopeless given the factors where they come from. So think about how we encourage early childhood teachers to get to know families and communities, make home visits. Well, if you're doing that and now you're like, man, this kid's life is messed up. I can't do nothing. That's not what we really want to do in this situation, right? You can have a backfire in the fact, right? Knowing a child is suffering from home issues should not make you less resistant to help them, right? But that can happen. And I don't how many people realize that that could be, you know, the, the reverse of that, right? It could have that negative effect. Um, and so that's something important as well, too. If we have the hope that a child can succeed when they are in our preschool, how does that affect how we treat them in the classroom? We're going to give them less response time. We're going to give them less challenging work, right? We're going to excuse bad behaviors because, well, that's just who they are, right? And so that's going to be all of those things are going to limit that child as well, too. Although this study analyzed the results of black teachers compared to white teachers, the reality is that all teachers have implicit bias. Everybody does, right? And we must recognize and embrace the challenge of disrupting how our biases might negatively affect the relationship we have with our children in the classroom. So I know this is a lot. Where do you start? I mean, implicit biases are hard um, to pick out. And for those of you who are here for the program, I'm welcome to talk about this more um, tomorrow in our talk. Uh, we can. Um, look at the study more in detail, or what, what can you do when you recognize? I think it's recognizing the bias first. Whenever I feel like I have a bias against someone, and in my mind, I say, well, what made you say that? Like, what made you think that, right? And examining it. It's not, I'm not a bad person, it's just how I think, right? But if I interrogate where that came from, then I might be lead to question why I had that thought in the first place. So we can do some work around that. But I get it, this is really, really hard work. Um, there are days where it feels like you're probably like, I didn't sign up for this, right? I wanted to teach little kids because they're cute. <laughs> That's fun. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, there are times when you're going to want to give up and go back um, to being, to ignoring bias, to being colorblind. Ignorance is bliss. Because once you know, you can't unknow. Okay? It's hard to forget. I wish I could forget these things, but I can't. I've learned them all, um, and things can't be changed at all. Um, but I implore you to recognize when you're feeling frustrated and hopeless. That's the first step. When, you're, when it seems like it's too much, acknowledge that. Like, this work is hard, and I am pissed, I'm, I'm angry, I don't know what to do. Recognize and honor that, because that's important. And then take a break, right? Take a break. I take a social media break. I go camping in the woods for three days where I can't talk to nobody on the phone. It's wonderful. Um, take a break because you need that time. And feed your soul, right? Go see some friends. I have one good friend and a professor in uh, Florida, and she, we, we have research meetings on the beach. <laughs> um, but she's always like, when I'm with my non-educator girlfriends, all we do are talk like reality TV and boy. She's like, and when I'm there, we're talking like, fix the world and down with the <laughs> So sometimes you need that, right? You need that kind of feeling um, with that, that's feeding her soul, and she can go back to the work that she's doing after our long research session at Fort Lauderdale Beach. <laughs> Um, and then I implore you to come back to this work and continue it because it may be hard, but I promise you it is worth it. Our children are worth it um, when all else fails. 